Um, I have the pleasure of introducing um, the Healing Roots of Abortion and Wounded Heroes workshop today. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Nancy and Cindy here. Uh, Nancy Brown is a retired marriage and family therapist who has worked as a nurse and a therapist for San Diego Hospice New Parent Support Program, which is a home visitation program dedicated to child abuse prevention and in private practice psychotherapy. Uh, recent years have been devoted to editing books and papers on the overlap between religion and psychology and to post-abortion healing, both writing about it and facilitating post-abortion workshops, um, healing work. Currently living in Northwest Arkansas with hus her husband and attending St. Nicholas Antiochian Orthodox Church in Springdale, Arizona. Arkansas. Right? Arkansas. Arkansas. Oh, I'm like, that's not the right abbreviation. <laughs> Uh, Cindy was chrismated into the Christian Orthodox faith in 2008 and is a grateful member of St. Matthew Antiochian Church in North Royalton, Ohio. She has a bachelor's degree in nursing, holds a master's degree in Christian ministry from Malone University, and earned her master's degree in applied Orthodox theology from the University of Balmont, Lebanon. Among other positions, she had previously supported, she's previously worked as the medical service director for Pregnancy Support Center of Stark County, Ohio, and is currently the co-chair for OC Life St. Matthews. Cindy lives in North Royalton, Ohio, with her wonderful husband, Greg Craig, is the stepmother of three beautiful daughters, the mother-in-law of two brilliant son-in-laws, <laughs> and the thrilled grandmother of Henry, Yvonne, Sophie, Max, and Sadie. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Thank you. So uh, I presented also uh, at Ocamper 2022 on post-abortion healing. And if you're interested, that was um, published in the Synergio. So that, uh, so um, there I started a crucial, well, I voiced what was a crucial discovery for me that until I accepted the reality, the personhood of my aborted child, I did not feel like a person myself. So based on my ongoing post-abortion healing journey on research and my work with post-abortive women, I embraced the topic of embodied personhood. Penny Otos Nellis in his book, Deification in Christ, Orthodox Perspectives on the Nature of Human Personhood says, man is characterized fundamentally by the mystery of love, which inwardly impels persons to natural communion. He is conscious, personal existence in time. He is an indissoluble psychosomatic unity with unfathomable depths. He is free, sovereign, creative, rational, scientific. Mystery. No matter how much we think we know about ourselves, God, or another person, we never exhaust the mystery. Just think of the pregnant woman experiencing the unfolding but never-ending mystery of her child and herself as she participates in this relationship. Personhood is not a static concept, but a dy dynamic process, a lived reality. Science can be useful as long as we see that science may be tempted to think of an unborn child strictly in biological terms. But only God has authority over life and death and over who you're called to be. <clears throat> Inwardly impelled by love toward communion. Note how dynamic that is. We are conceived by God, that is love, in love and for the sake of love. The more research I have done, the more I appreciate that the drive toward relationality goes on from the moment of conception. There is only relationship where each one involved is distinct, that is having a distinct, a unique personality. This is the ultimate purpose of everyone called into life, communion with God and others, which leads to deification. Psychosomatic unity. Even though abortion has gone on for centuries, much of its becoming so widespread in our times may stem from how we separate soul and body. We overemphasize body at the expense of soul or soul at the expense of body. Now let's look at the personhood of the unborn child. 
As Orthodox Christians, we believe that un the unborn child is a person from the moment of conception. Recent developments in science seem to support this, this view to me. Um, and, this, and looking at the scientific view of this can be very moving for the man or woman undergoing post-abortion healing. Just think of how ultrasounds have affected the incidence of abortion. If you're not familiar with that, they have very much decreased the incidence of abortion. These developments in science, ultrasound and others, contribute to a greater appreciation of the humanity from conception. To quote David Chamberlain, the emerging view of dynamic, responsive life in utero contrasts sharply with the failed view of fetal passivity and unconsciousness, calling for a redefinition of who babies are and what they can know and do. Babies are capable of leading the gentle revolution of who we think we are and want to be. Wouldn't we be a better culture and we would be better humans if we could learn more from babies? <laughs> Unborn babies have both relationality and consciousness. Relationality begins with the baby, even from conception, being affected by what is going on with the mother and in her environment and the mother being affected by the life she is carrying in her womb. As the pregnancy progresses, there will even be interaction. I believe that much of the trauma of abortion for both the baby and the mother is the severing of that connection, the supposed severing of the relationship. Science is moving away from limiting consciousness to the locus or even formation of the brain. The brain may be required for certain forms of consciousness, but studies of what has been called cellular memory call into play other forms of consciousness. We're talking about how the baby can be conscious from, from conception. For example, one could regard DNA that resides in every cell as a form of information, not only storage, but also process. Moreover, biological cell assemblies work in concert with neural networks, this has led Thomas Verney to assert cells remember their origin all the way back to conception. This form of memory from conception feels so true to me, and I'm always asking myself a question of conscience, and it seems to me it's related to the cellular memory somehow. Now, if we add the recent study of epigenetics, we can see that in a sense, some cells remember even from before conception. Epigenetics is the dynamic process which affects gene expression in response to physical and psychosocial factors. And of course, I would add that another way of saying that is gene expression is affected by sin. Yet these epigenetic effects can go on for generations. This is important and relevant to abortion and post-abortion healing in three ways. The unborn child, rather than being a blank slate, will not have sin in terms of culpability, but will be carrying an epigenetic history with certain predispositions and tendencies, a family history. Second, because epigenetics is passable, that is able to be affected, we can pass on better than we got through healing. And third, that healing is not just cleaning up our act or receiving a pronouncement externally, but is operant pardon me, at the cellular and bodily level. The woman will bring her whole epigenetic history, relational, family of origin, culture, into post-abortion healing, and this, and this healing may impact that very history. Now let us turn to the embodied personhood of the woman choosing abortion. The delusion that we get to say who or who is not human is only equaled by the delusion that a person can choose abortion and be the same person afterwards as before the choice. That one can somehow erase the experience of, of abortion from the psychosomatic unity of the body and soul. Often when the effects are carried less consciously, the body will still keep score. For example, post-abortive women, post women have increased tendency toward pregnancy complications, in future pregnancies, 
or may have other gynecological issues and an increased vulnerability to breast cancer. The PTSD from the total experience, especially the procedure itself and the separation from one's child may lead to autoimmune compromise, for example, fibromyalgia. I do, I do not believe that there are strictly physical and strictly emotional effects, but that the two are always together. Besides these effects, these epigenetic effects, there is the matter of microchimerism. Microchimerism is where some cells carried in the blood between the mother and child during pregnancy remain in the mother's body. This can go on for decades. Embodied life is the arena of action, of relationship, of impact on our whole epigenetic legacy. Nella speaks of the impact to our God-given functions. Functions that may be affected by abortion are primarily relationship, that is, relationship with God, self, and others, including spouse and children. Moreover, being able to work, to move forward in life, to grieve, to worship, to parent, to form a couple. Now I'll say a bit more about post-abortion healing. I've been in consultation with and attended a conference put on by Rama International, who does post-abortion healing all over the world. Though the founder is not orthodox, she and I fully agree with their sense that the first two oddly interrelated things that need to happen for post-abortion healing to begin are talk about the abortion and talk about God, how God's thought about and how God is related to. The woman must tell her abortion story. In order to facilitate that telling, if it feels appropriate, I begin by talking about my own abortion. This is to help the woman feel at ease. It is absolutely crucial that the woman begin to talk about the abortion, to break the isolation. During the course of the healing work, the story will change some or deepen, but it must be talked about. The other crucial element is to talk about God, how one not only, not, how one not only sees God but relates to God. Is there a prayer life, a confessional life? What is the history to truly heal? Work, this work requires a personal experience of Christ, compassion, and holiness. The way one talks about God will also change some during the course of this work. What is needed is an integration of Christ's forgiveness, not just a pronouncement, and especially not a one and done, but a dynamic process that becomes ever more fully cellular if we might use that expression. That integration of forgiveness can only happen as healing progresses. To quote Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, this olive twig means that forgiveness is freely given, that time and new possibilities open up ahead of us. We cannot always follow this way because it is not enough just to have time and new possibilities opening up if we are sick at heart, if we are broken in will, or if we are incapable in mind or body, either of discerning or of following the path. We need healing. The healing power of God will make it possible for us to take advantage of the gift of forgiveness that is offered, and indeed of the gift of time and space and eternity. The workbook we use for post-abortion healing is structured and based on scriptures and offers the po following possibilities of supporting the healing journey. Reconciliation of relationships with God, others, child, and self. Breaking out of the prison of shame. A place for grieving and memory eternal. And taking up new life. Andriana Kapoulos, also a facilitator of post-abortion healing, will say more about the wound of abortion and this healing journey. For now, I shall close by saying that how I would conceptualize or put words to my own healing journey borrows from the words of St. Sophroni. And unfortunately, I missed the slide, so I'm actually going to say this twice. O oh Lord, eternal and creator of all things, who of thy inscrutable goodness called me to this life, 
I'll say that one more time. O Lord, eternal and creator of all things, who of thy inscrutable goodness called me to this life. Though I betrayed my initial call into life, the call that was the gift of my child, and many other calls along the way, today I am being called to this life. And I pray to answer that call. Now I'll turn it over to Andriona Kapolos. My pregnancy was not unexpected. In fact, my husband, three children, and I were ecstatic to welcome another child. Tragically, an early sonogram revealed a very large cystic hygroma on the back of the baby's neck spanning most of his body. The outcome was predicted to be poor, only an 8 to 10% survival to birth, and even then would only live minutes, hours, or days. During this time, I did a lot of research. I learned that hydrops, a condition that is associated, can mirror in the body of the mother and can cause many issues, including heart failure. As I tried to face what I was being told and all of the frightening possibilities, not just for myself, but for my husband and children, I stayed up all night reading scripture, praying, and at the same time trying to research how to have your baby die at home. My deepest prayer was that God would take my baby for me. My doctor presented me with an alternative to terminate my pregnancy. In my heart, I knew that abortion would devastate me. But like the women who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy, I also found myself in a place where it all became too much. The pressures mounted of all the ways this was affecting me and my family. When for just a moment I tried to take a breath, it all fell apart and my strength was gone. While my story is different from many other women, the devastation is the same. The highly traumatic experience of abortion is the same. And this goes for me, a faithful woman who had support from a loving husband, family, my church. Many women walking into an abortion are alone without any support. After the horrific day that my pregnancy was terminated, I was fully convinced nothing could ever be beautiful again. My greatest fear was that I could not be forgiven because I could not forgive myself. I was suicidal and completely overcome with grief. I felt shame, guilt, numbness, fear, hopelessness, horror, and separated from God. I was completely robbed of my personhood. I felt empty, a shell of the woman I once was. My parish priest was incredibly supportive. He offered me confession and gave me a service for my child. I was allowed the right to grieve the loss of my baby. I'm forever grateful for that. It meant everything to me and was my first step toward healing. Months passed of being in despair, absent from my own life. Finally, answer to prayer. Through Zoe for Life, I was put in touch with other post-abortion women now working to support healing. The meaningful time we worked together changed my life and helped me to fully open my wound so that I could properly heal with guidance from Scripture and the Holy Spirit. I learned that I'm worthy of forgiveness, worthy of the plan God has for my life. I have the chance to change the course for someone else and to help someone else who has already made the same mistake I have made. I have learned that I have something to give, and the pain of abortion is not a pain anyone should endure alone. Though the circumstances that lead to abortion are quite different, the tragedy and the gut-wrenching pain are the same. We share the same wounding. Through this experience, my heart has been charged with the need for our church to provide tools and resources to help us live in the world. We need our fellow Christians to walk with us in times of despair. We need sacraments, that, but to fully partake of these sacraments, we need another more practical peace. We need to overcome judgment. We need to wrap our arms around those who have made mistakes that could send them into isolation from God and the church. We need to show those who are struggling 
that church is most where they need to be for community and healing. And we need to be proactive. The awareness needs to happen before a woman finds herself in a crisis pregnancy. By that time, there is so much going on. Emotions, fog, denial, fear, and a ticking clock. This is the value of seeing others struggle in church before we find ourselves in a similar crisis. As human beings living in a fallen world, we have a shared experience. Life is full of challenges and struggles. In our deepest pain, God's light is revealed. If we allow him, God will use our softened hearts to radiate the light of Christ's knowledge and love hopefully lighting the path for others. Let light shine out of darkness. Corinthians 2. I'm actually glad that took a little minute to get to that slide. We need to let that sink in. Thank you. Thank you. The stated mission of Orthodox Christians for Life is to equip the Orthodox Christian community to strengthen its commitment to the sacredness of human life from conception to death, illuminating the Church's teaching on life issues through education and engagement. So then, exactly what is our ministry? Not just the ministry of OCL, but our ministry as Orthodox Christians relative to this. Of course, we support life in the womb from the moment of conception. And absolutely, as you heard just a minute ago, we support and minister to those who have made or had to make life-ending decisions for their children in the womb. To bring those mothers and fathers and everybody concerned back to full communion with God, never calling good what is evil, and always separating the sin from the sinner. And certainly we support natural as opposed to hasten death. But what about life issues, relative to life issues? This is living a life, being an incarnation of life that demonstrates the sanctity of life, a life that is holy and pure in body and soul. This means we're going to talk about chastity, which may be more than what you might think. So in addition to the specific ministries that we just mentioned and that you have heard about, how do we come alongside those who are suffering the wounds of poor usually specifically sexual life choices and misdirected behaviors in search of fulfillment of their deepest desires. Certainly all of these encounters do not end in pregnancy, but they cause deep and recalcitrant wounds nonetheless. We know that the whole focus of our Orthodox faith is to live a doxological Eucharistic life. So pretty much everything we might want to talk about relative to our faith could fit under this reality. But this talk is focused specifically on living a life of chastity, a life of purity and conduct and intention, a sane and balanced life in harmony of body, mind, and heart. This is to what we're called. It is a life that is exactly the opposite of the entropy or the chaos from which God called us at creation. It is true freedom in the orderly creation to which we are called. For that to occur, we have to allow God into those deep places, shameful places within us. As St. Sophroni says, we have to be willing to bear a little shame. That's what you witnessed. That's what you witnessed. Because the true desire, that which is actually endemic to our nature, is not satisfied with the pleasure sought by the passions it will go to extreme measures, even deep into pain, in order to be found by what it seeks. So says Dr. Timothy Patsitsas. He's been very present here at this conference. And what it seeks is intimacy. That's our deep desire. 
And unfortunately, deep, deep into pain is often what is needful for that true desire to be found. Because, truth be told, many of us live lives lives closer to St. Mary of Egypt than we do to the Theotokos. This almost necessarily means, at least for many, that struggle, perseverance, and often misguided life choices precede our journey into those depths where true desire resides. Because, as I know we are all aware, and it's been mentioned many times here at this conference, the fall of Adam and Eve placed us outside of paradise, where we no longer live in blissful, unadulterated union with our Creator. Instead, we push Him away, the very source of our life, as we seek to fill our lives with adulterations of Him, fallen behaviors in a fallen world. Because from that point forward, from the fall to present day, the life we embody is no longer satisfied with purity, chastity, unadulterated, chaste arrows. We lean toward chaos. We lean toward entropy. And yet the need for deep intimacy and our true desire remains. It lives within us as the life of the life that is in us. And we know that left unchecked, Our fallen hungers, cravings, our passions, which rush in to fill the void, and they do rush in, nature abhors a vacuum, they will further distort our pure spiritual craving, that part of us that is enlivened and vivified by the Holy Spirit. This distortion continually worsens because, as we know, nothing in creation is static. It either moves toward God or it, towards unity, toward beauty, or it moves toward entropy, toward disorder, chaos. If we move toward entropy, the godliness that we were created to embody becomes so distorted as to be nearly unrecognizable. And because it is our true, deepest desire, intimacy, that we seek, this distortion, more often than not, is of a sexual nature. And I know that we all know this, but it needs to be stated. <clears throat> we cannot enter into this intimate relationship with just any God. It has to be the triune, ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible God. Correct theology really matters. Who God is, who he really is, is important. It's paramount because unless this is the God with whom we are entering into communion, then we are necessarily communing with a heresy, a manifestation of our passion with our own ego, a God of our own making. Theology, says Father Stephen Freeman, rightly done, is a path toward union with God. It is absolutely, he says, more than an academic exercise. Correct theology informs us that our true desire is for intimacy, communion with God, and with each other for the glory of God. And correct theology tells us from Psalm 40 that our sins wound our soul. In other words, if we are to assuage, to heal the discomfort, the shame, the pain created when we distort this desire, then we have to live a correct theology. Again, as Dr. Petitza's questions, if theology is not being done with the healing of the soul and mind, why would it even matter? Correct theology matters. I know I'm making a big deal about this because, as Nancy mentioned, there are healing programs. There are workbooks and therapy techniques and groups for this, and actually many of them are quite effective. The challenge is that they don't derive from an orthodox paradigm, an orthodox mindset and so are not entirely correct theology, and therefore not entirely incarnational theology. This is why I'm talking to O'Camper about this. Firstly, because members of this group are the designated experts in physical and spiritual healing. Um, We know they go hand in hand, right? The physical is always created for the spiritual. Secondly, because every time I bring up this topic at my parish, chastity, sexual integrity, purity to anyone in our parish, what I hear is, we need to teach that to our teens. Well, fair enough. 
We do. They need to know this. That's absolutely true. But first, we need to understand and embrace it for ourselves. And we need to be healed from the effects of our own unchaste, misdirected arrows. And almost as an aside, it's not just about sex. We don't separate sex from our overall theological life. That is an unnatural uncoupling. This is actually what sexual corruption is. It's that most intimate physical act that's separated from the mysticism and symbolism of Christ and his bride, from the sanctity of marriage. Just as sex is intended as an embodiment of pure, unadulterated marital love, orthodoxy, true orthodoxy, is pure, unadulterated, incarnational faith as experienced through intimacy with Christ. It is an incarnation of chaste eros, a renunciation of self, and a complete turning toward the other. It is an aesthetic labor for the purpose of a godly life. For clarification's sake, we'll just define our terms a little bit. As I said, chastity is more than just sexual monogamy. It's even more than monogamy inside of marriage. And as I already said, it's more than just about sex. It is essentially a purity of behavior, intent, and thought for our heart's true desire, its embodiment of our faith. The Roman Catholics actually recognize this when they state in in their Catechism of the Catholic Church that chastity lets us love with an upright and undivided heart. And as St. Cyprian says, for what is chastity but a virtuous mind added to watchfulness over the body? Chastity, he says, promotes the freedom in relationships that comes with innocence and the beauty of modesty. So far from being restrictive or burdensome, it is actually freedom. It's freedom in relationships. So chastity then, far from being a negative, something we cannot do, is actually a positive state of beauty that results from freedom from passions which enslave us while paradoxically tempting us with false forms of the very freedoms that they steal. Of course, the church knows this, as we are especially reminded all throughout Lent as we pray over and over again that great prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian, give me the spirit of chastity. We're talking about chaste eros. So similarly, eros is often misunderstood because it is the word from which erotic is derived. It is almost completely understood in terms of pornography or aberrant sexual proclivities. To the contrary, Eros is literally the love that makes us renounce ourselves, forget ourselves entirely, and run toward the other. So chaste eros, then, is love's mad self-forgetting, according to, again, Dr. Timothy Pizzitzas. It is repentance. It's a turning, a renunciation of self, and a complete turning toward the other. As St. Seraphim explains, through repentance, we can recover our true chastity. It's a tall order, I have no doubt, and one that few of us achieve without stumbling. We all have our stuff, sins, wounds of the soul with which we struggle. That is the Christian life. Discovering and living in and only in this intimate relationship is a battle. It is the battle. As Father Hotko would say, the Christian life is a battle. It is blood to the end. That's what we're talking about. And then there are those of us who have more than stumbled. We have fallen headlong into the abyss of sexual promiscuity and other self-destructive and others' destructive behaviors. We, I am including myself in this, are those have experienced firsthand that sex outside the sacrament of marriage is the exemplar of unchaste eros, an icon par excellence of how the enemy works. The enemy who takes what God intended as icon of his love for us, the church as his bride, and twists it into something that becomes the end in and of itself. Not for communion with God, for the glory of God, but for self-satisfaction, unchaste, undisciplined pleasure. It is chaos instead of order. It is profanity 
instead of sanctity. It is ashes and deformity instead of beauty. It is analogous to King Uzziah in Second Chronicles, when he entered the Holy of Holies when he had no right to be there. And God struck him with leprosy from which he suffered until he died. The sexual act is so intimate as to be akin to our Holy of Holies, the physical created for the spiritual. When we enter unsacramentally into the Holy of Holies of another, or we allow another or others to enter unsacramentally into our Holy of Holies, we suffer from spiritual leprosy. Deep, infectious, highly contagious wounds and distortions. Unchaste passion is like that. It is the epitome of taking that which has not been given, that for which we are not prepared. A behavior as old as time, we're back to Adam and Eve in the garden of the tree of of knowledge, and its effects, this spiritual leprosy, do not go away through prayer alone, not even through prayer and fasting, except in rare cases, again, I cite St. Mary of Egypt, Of course, repentance and confession are absolutely necessary. They open the door for what is truly needful. Again, as Dr. Petitsis reminds us, if it is truly communion that we want, our true desire, then we need to know that the road to the Eucharist runs right through confession. But what is needful to restore optimal soul health is deep and abiding healing. Often a perfunctory or even a diligent confession alone isn't sufficient for this because sex outside the sacrament of marriage not only does not satisfy, it frustrates and inflames our true desire. What we are dealing with is a truly infected wound. Septic. We're spiritually septic. Deep wounds such as this can often be soothed or temporarily temporarily relieved in this fashion just like an infected wound immediately feels better if it's lanced. But unless it's appropriately treated, it won't fully heal. God is our true desire. So with him, intimacy with him is what we crave and what will be frustrated until it is realized. So we allow God into those deep, dark, shameful places within us so that we may be healed and so that we can help others to go there as well. That's actually what you witnessed in the first two presentations. We bear our own shame so that we can bear others, the shame of others. We follow the example of Christ who heals us by his wounds. So when I hear, or you hear, or maybe you even think, we need to teach chastity to our teens, we can understand that it is a lot more comfortable to teach it to our teens than to get personal about this topic ourselves. I suspect most people don't even want to talk about this, let alone talk about it with each other or another. Um, To be perfectly honest, I'm one of them. But God has spurred me to disclose my own unchaste arrows unto healing for his glory and to accompany others relative to the varied and extreme, and I mean extreme brokenness, that accompanies unchaste erotic passion. To be perfectly honest, this has been on my heart for several years. So what you are witnessing is actually my belated and incredibly reluctant obedience to this call. But I know that if we are to teach this to members of our Orthodox community, not just teens, adults need this too, we must be willing to go deep into our own pain and bear a little shame, to find and commune with our true desire become an incarnation of that true desire so that we can help others do the same for the glory of God. So in true orthodox fashion, we incarnate that which we desire to teach. We never just talk about it. We don't just teach it. We embody it, we personify it, and we walk with others who desire to do the same. If we are to be true spiritual confidants, priests, therapists, friends, brothers, and sisters to each other unto maximum healing, then our calling is to go to those deep, dark, shameful places, first within ourselves and then with others. As St. John Chrysostom reminds us, we are healed of our crosses to bear more crosses. 
Sometimes, oftentimes, it's to bear the crosses of others. This absolutely is true for those who are called to come alongside others who have experienced the trauma of abortion, but it's also true for those who have been called to minister to others who are bruised and broken from sexual sin, which most often is the result of chasing our true desires in an aberrant fashion, unchaste arrows. Because only then can we effectively carry the pain and shame of others who have yet to answer this calling for themselves. Those who are struggling, beaten, broken, battle-weary. That is what this talk is about. It is an encouragement to dive as deeply as we possibly can into those wounded, yet-to-be-healed parts of us where God is waiting to be found. We can bear the pain and shame of others so that they can be healed. It's the Pauline admonishment, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We know because of Christ's example that this is the embodiment of life. St. Gregory of Nyssa tells us, the quality of holiness is shown not by what we say, but by what we do in life. So we are sharing our experiences, our strengths, our hopes, and a little bit of our expertise in anticipation of further healing for us and for others. We know that wounds kept in the dark fester and become infected. Do not heal. Bringing them to the light is the beginning of healing. Long after, years after, repentance and confession, cleansing and healing, the scars remain. The healing continues. Our talk today is part of that. And so we pray, as St. Nikolai Volimirovich taught us, O most radiant day, dawn in my soul, so that I may see the aim of my tangled path. O son of sons, the only event in the universe that attracts my heart. Illumine my inner self so that I may see who has dared to dwell there besides you, so that I may eradicate from it all the fruits that seem sweet from the outside, but smell rotten in their core. Lord have mercy. Thank you for your time. Okay, so for discussion, um, feedback, thoughts, questions, anything. As you notice, we're quite open. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well... I could, I've only been able to be here for today, but I I'm just want to say, let you know I appreciate the vulnerability and the transparency and the honesty in which you presented. It was phenomenal and, and the only uh, experience in all of the uh, presentations, which were all great in their own right, oh, yeah. but that those components uh-huh. are unique to yours, and oh, I love thank it. You. Thank you. One of the questions that we wanted to ask is, do you think that your parish is a safe place with which to disclose this kind of this kind of thing? What makes it so or not? This Nurse. is a little <laughs> controversial, but uh-huh. I feel like I don't know. I feel like this is this topic is only preached to men. So mostly to men. Mm-hmm. The chastity thing. Mm-hmm. Which I think mm-hmm. is I mean, that's just my perspective as a woman, um, but I feel like it's not really... The women's perspective on it is talked about from a very different perspective, mm-hmm. um, such as, like, oh, like, you need to, like, keep them safe from this, mm-hmm. versus, like, it's not talked about from the perspective of, like, our own chastity individually, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I feel like... Um, in turn causes it to be not a safe place to share because if no one's talking about it you feel like very weird like even bringing it up as an issue because Mm -hmm. it's not an issue right Right. like it's like such a minute thing that it's like Mm -hmm. why would that even happen Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like that would be something that would happen Mm -hmm. so you're just like Mm -hmm. i'm just not gonna talk about that Mm -hmm. like you know what i mean like that's just not something i would bring up um and even like the language that's used like if something does happen, and this maybe this is just like the, pe- the places that I've been in, mm-hmm. but um, the impression is like, 
Um, not that you struggled with anything, but that like you were pushed into something because of someone else, oh. because of people pleasing tendencies or something like that. So I think that it needs to be talked about more because if that's the impression, then you can't even work on the problem because the problem is not even being acknowledged. Right. That's the issue. right, right. That's a really good point. I can tell you too from um, my own experience when I worked in crisis pregnancy mm-hmm. that Orthodox women never even considered carrying an unplanned pregnancy because that wasn't talked about. Yeah. <laughs> now, this has been many, many years ago, and mm-hmm. it has opened up significantly since then. But, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. That mm-hmm. is so true. Mm-hmm. And this is our own journey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had another question. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious, is it Adriana or Adriana? Andriana. Andriana. Um, you had mentioned when you shared um, about the isolation of women in post-abortion healing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious what practically it would look like for a parish mm-hmm. to not isolate women that are experiencing mm-hmm. post-abortion or even, in, I think I would imagine some of those isolated parts is before the abortion, correct? Right? Mm-hmm. And so in a, in a reality, in a cultural reality where it is not talked about, what is an appropriate way, or how do we bring that barrier down? How could we support? How could we remove the isolation element? I think part of it is starting with this, mm-hmm. having the conversation, being able, even though it's difficult, to mm-hmm. come out and talk about it, let people understand these are things that happen. And, you know, abortion is not just a concern that impacts an unwed mother, a routine mother who finds herself pregnant. I'm a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think number one, conversation. Number two, being able to get a little bit um, better organized, working on an orthodox book for healing, which I know is something Nancy has talked about doing, um, that actually lays out the path for that. Uh, increasing facilitators that can actually go um, and work with women after the fact um, and work with them towards healing the way that I did and then hopefully now I'm working to help others. So I think there's a lot of things we can do but as far as the initial um, question which is how do you maybe prevent it or do be proactive as I said is People have to have these conversations mm-hmm. before it's an issue. Mm-hmm. And part of bringing others back into church or wrapping our arms around those who are struggling gets those conversations going. Mm-hmm. And instead of saying, oh, we have this woman who is unmarried and pregnant, instead of her feeling shunned, she should feel, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, this woman is doing something that is so difficult. Mm-hmm. And God bless her for that. And just not be afraid to say, you know what? We're all flawed. We're all going to have issues. And we need to have the conversations. Um, So there's a lot that we need to do, honestly. Well, and and then another thing is if the issue ever comes to confession, Mm -hmm. if our clergy were more educated Mm -hmm. on that, Mm -hmm. there are places Mm -hmm. that they can refer women who are struggling with, you know, as we talk about integrating that forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I think education of the clergy, Absolutely. but mm-hmm. I, I think what Andriana says is so important that we have to be willing to self-disclose and mm-hmm. to um, mm-hmm. talk about our own situation and, uh, and mm-hmm. just other women seeing that it's possible mm-hmm. will then be. I do think there's this, it's kind of like a, I don't know what the right way to say this is, it's when we don't talk about something that is stigmatizing, um, unfortunately it creates sort of preconceived notions about right. who, which women right. have portions. Right. right. We have this image of women that have portions. Right. We assume what the experience mm-hmm. is like, mm-hmm. and then those assumptions in turn lead 
majority of the people to wrong conclusions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not fully actualized conclusions, and completely can lead people astray. So yeah. Yeah. even even yeah. assuming that a pregnancy is desired, like when you find out that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a woman is pregnant, like how to have those conversations about mm -hmm. what a woman truly feels about that pregnancy right. or the confusion that it might I think it has a lot to do with um, educating the women mm -hmm. in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, the women who have been the stalwarts of the church, you know, who've been, you know, they, I mean, people kind of bow down to them because they've been in the church and people see them and, but, at the same time, there's, I don't know, maybe a denial that these kind of things happen. Right. Well, and just to the point that people don't seem to talk about it, I did go to my priest, and he was wonderful. And I worked closely with him, and we talked, and I, as a matter of fact, talked with three different priests. And nobody mentioned Mm -hmm. Zoe for life, mm -hmm. which would have been, it doesn't mean things would have been different, but I think we need to all do a better job of making sure we all know all of the things we have access to. As Orthodox Christians, mm -hmm. there are people to support. I mean, and I think part of wanting to do this is saying like, okay, here we are. This, mm -hmm. You have a place to go. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I was spending hours looking everywhere online and 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 the chances were higher that you would have found a non-orthodox place yes so <laughs> thank god you found and that's part of the mission of ocl is to get get that word out there so that our communities know that we're there to help that as well oh, yeah. because yeah i think i will say the protestant world the catholic world too is very good they're, they're, they're much better at getting that word out you know they're kind of known and so this, this ministry is trying really hard to do that, to get that word out there so that, so that a, an Orthodox Christian is, is embodied there to walk through that process. Yeah. And I just wanted to say one thing, that men can be very affected oh by post-abortion trauma as well. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I, I am aware of some men who have gone through yep. post-abortion trauma. So am I. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, grandparents. Grandparents. Everybody's affected. Yeah. Everyone's affected. Yeah. Um, I am I'm curious. I actually, even though I've been in the church for ever, uh, did not know about deaconesses. Or I didn't think it was applicable to orthodoxy, I think, is why. I mean, I, I, and so I don't know if kind of, I don't know where this um, this baby center is, you know, mm -hmm. I'm kind of reestablishing deaconesses, but the power of pairing the two together, mm -hmm. um, you know, for that kind of communication between the priests and the deaconess, you know, I mean, like that partnership, um, or that, and maybe that that's a loss of a partnership that existed back um, whenever deaconesses were more active mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. part of the church. Mm -hmm. Anything well, else? One comment I just wanted to make uh, with regard to what Cindy said is I was reading something the other day and you were talking about the Holy of Holies in terms of, of, of sexual chastity and, and not going into that place. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was reading about somebody having this very intimate conversation where they shared everything, you know, their most intimate heartbreaks mm -hmm. and sins. And that was also called the Holy of Holies. It is. That's letting someone into your Holy of Holies. Yeah. yeah. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all very so much. much. Mm -hmm.